Hello, welcome to The Drill. Steve Lowry, Tom Hofarth, John McKelvey, Nicole, Elizabeth, and Jack over there. And Jack's dad is right here with us, Dr. Darren Treasure. Dr. Treasure is a, um, I, I knew I'm going to blow this. <laughs> He's a mental performance coach. Basically, there you go. he helps people get the maximum out of, of the, out of their noggin <laughs> and perform well. <laughs> Uh, in sports and in life, I would imagine. Uh, it's a pleasure having you here. Thank you. Thanks, man. Thanks for um, there's a bunch of things we want to talk to you about, uh, but we were just talking about something right before we came out here, and I'd like to start there, which is a lot of us feel that um, athletes, elite athletes, professional athletes are different from us. And you were saying, no, that's actually not true at all. We, we think that they have a brain that allows them to do these kinds of things. You are saying that, no, they're just like you, um, can you elaborate on that? Like, Well, I, th I think the, the reality is they have a brain that has been conditioned to do certain things in certain situations. Yeah. So they're very, very good in, for example, competing at the highest level under a lot of pressure. Yeah. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they're any better than anybody else or any different than anybody else in a relationship. Right. Or in an environment where they don't feel confident. Right. Um, I can remember being in grad school and we had a quarterback at Illinois who ended up being, I think he was the number one pick. And we, he was, he gave a talk, um, and it was just awful. Right. And I can remember Jeff talking George. to him, Jeff George, yeah. And I can remember talking to him, <laughs> talking to a buddy of his afterwards, and he says he has been freaking out about this. Right. I mean, he's been so stressed about giving this talk, and right. it was to like a sport journalism class that yeah. I was sitting in on, and it was just awful. Yeah. That Saturday, he went out and he played against Michigan in front of 80,000 people in Memorial Stadium, right. live TV on ABC, and he was magnificent. Right. So the issue was, well, what changed? Is he a different person? I said, no, he's the same person. It's just the environment changed, his comfort level changed, what he felt good at doing changed. Right. And that's what made him be, at that point, an, an elite level quarterback at the collegiate level. How, when you when you bring someone in to work with, um, I imagine you do like an initial kind of um, assessment of that mm -hmm. person. What do you, what are you looking for when you? What are the little cues that maybe the athlete doesn't understand that you're looking for about that person to say, "Oh, we need to work on this. Oh, he's, he's got a lot of that." What are you looking at? Every athlete's different because yeah. they come in at. Self-awareness is such a key aspect of performance in any domain of life yeah. or any you know, life in general, right? right? I mean, if you have a good understanding. So some athletes will come in and they'll say, okay, this is what I need to work on. Can yeah. you help me? Um, other athletes will come in and say, I need a lot of help, but I don't know where we should start. So right. a, a lot of it is just, just listening yeah. and listening to the athlete describe who they are, what they've been going through, um, the challenges they're currently facing, yeah, um, and and it, it varies. I mean, there's a there's a perception that in my field that people come in because they have a problem. The, the most fun athletes to work with are the ones who come in and they say, "I'm the number two in the country at what I do. I need this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you help me find this?" Right. Because a lot of times with my athletes, I have sort of long-term relationships with a number of um, professional athletes who every year I say, "Okay, we're done," because mm -hmm. the whole concept of planned redundancy. I mean, why do yeah. you need me? And they go, no, 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 no. I love your eye. I love yeah. the fact you come to my games, you watch me, you watch me in practice, you talk to me during the week, and you right. pick up things that are my blind spots. Right. Yeah. So things evolve and change in terms of the nature of the relationship. But a lot of it, that, that intake process, is really getting to understand them and what they're truly trying to achieve and how potentially we can sort of increase their strengths and maybe pick up some limitations and helping them out with some strategies. What are common blocks you find it with a lot of athletes? I think at the elite level, it's it's in in a very simple way, it's confidence. Mm. That's really what it all comes down to. Because you know, I was talking to one of my NBA guys on uh, on Friday morning over breakfast, and he was saying every single person in the NBA is a freak right. physically, um, what they can do with their bodies, what they can do. And um, and anybody who thinks that you know the twelfth guy on anybody's roster is just an average athlete is an idiot because right. if you take that average athlete that you think's average and put him in any other environment, they yeah. can all score thirty points a game. Right. Okay. Now the ones who do it every single game are a little bit special, but they can right. all do it. So then it comes, well, what's different? Yeah. You know what, what? Why are some able to get the most out of their ability, whereas some seem to struggle? Why are there ups and downs? And a lot of it comes down to confidence right. and just trying to help them sort of understand 
how they actually make themselves as confident as they can be going into competition. Mm -hmm. And I think the other thing with a lot of young elite level athletes is that when they get to a certain point, where now all of a sudden they're not the best. Yeah. And they have to think about it differently. Yeah, well and they actually that. have to suddenly go, okay, what was really simple before is now no longer simple. Yeah. N now what do I do? Yeah. And we and hear about that all the time, that every level you go up, high school to college, college to pro, yeah. you go from being the top kid to being the bottom kid. And some people can never recover from that. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. We sort of need to explain a little bit, too, about your background for people that haven't heard your name, don't know uh, how, could how you to forget do a, a name like Darren Treasure. How to do a Google know. search. Yeah. But just sort of maybe in, in, you know, 50 words or less, sort of explain what you do and, and with the Oregon Project as well. Okay, so, um, well, originally for 10 years I was a university professor at Illinois and Arizona State. Mm -hmm. um, then in about 2003 I started just consulting full-time. Mm -hmm. um, working with organizations, individuals, federations on the mental side of sport. Um, a lot of it around motivation and a lot of it around peak performance. Um, in 2007, I got the opportunity to start working with uh, a running project based out of Beaverton uh, up in Oregon uh, called the Nike Oregon Project. Mm -hmm. So I've had the opportunity to work with some of the greatest distance runners um, over the course of the last 10, 11 years, uh, multiple Olympic champions, world champions, and so through that process, I sort of developed a, a sort of a, also a clientele of NBA and NFL players, mm -hmm. primarily um, working with them as well. So with what you do with elite athletes, can it apply to a weekend athlete in a lot of ways? I mean, I know a guy like me has tried a few 10Ks, and I think maybe physically I could have Why done it. Why are you laughing? But no, <laughs> because, because I laughed at the same time. <laughs> But, you know, if you've tried a 10K and you can't finish it, right. it's usually mental. <laughs> Physically, you can walk a 10K, Did right? Did you not finish a 10K? I, I just, like, crapped out. <laughs> Don't get specific, okay? <laughs> While my wife scooted ahead. But, you know, I'm just trying to figure out how – and I knew right away, I go, I'm just not mentally tough for this. Right. And then I went home and cried. And I <laughs> <laughs> Or intestinally, apparently, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I'm, I was just curious about how you apply sort of your technique to a average weekend athlete – whether it's through uh, a lecture you can watch on a YouTube video clip or a book or anything like that? Well, I think that, that fundamentally a lot of the lessons and, and the teachings and the way we understand the brain now and the way it operates, it applies to life in general. And, and because, I mean, the brain doesn't really know whether it's running a 10K or doing this. I mean, it's, right. it's just sort of responding to whatever information is being provided. Um, but yeah, I mean, I always try, when I lived in Arizona when I was at ASU, my, my big thing on a Friday night when my wife and I would go out for a drink would be, you know, she would introduce me and they say, well, what do you do? And, right. and I'd sort of tell them sure. and they go, well, could you help my golf game? And, I, and I'd always say, yep, I can guarantee you I can knock at least two shots off a round. Wow. And they would look at me and they go, well, you don't even know. What, what my handicap is. I said, it doesn't matter. I can guarantee oh, no. you two shots. I can apply that to golf. You you could knock 10 off me this, <laughs> this afternoon. <laughs> and it used to be like my party trick. And then it's like, you know, for a fee, obviously. Oh, yeah. Yeah. thank you. Oh, there yeah. you go. And then, and, Good night. And then they would leave. And then they would leave. <laughs> would be like, okay, we're done. But yeah, I mean, I think, I, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that the, whether or not you're a weekend warrior, as it were, if that we want to use that right. term. I a, guess that's what a, we call a, it. A, de yeah. a developing athlete or an elite level athlete. I think, you know, again, the brain operates the way the brain operates. Yeah. Um, you know, what, what's different between, for example, you and, you know, somebody who played in the U.S. Open? It's probably there's an element of the brain, but there's also most of it is physical. Well, this, um, this guy's left-handed and I'm right-handed. Maybe that's the difference. I use a different side of my brain. We have this... Uh, example to use phil mickelson had w was called by his playing partner a moment of madness where on the 13th uh, right. green he struck the ball as it was rolling and right. later explained that he was taking advantage of a rule but basically as the commentators were talking about he, he kind of and the thing about meltdown. and the thing about mickelson this has been one of the the criticisms of him is that he isn't completely mentally tough you hear this right. from him. he's never right. been able to win the u.s open which is generally considered the Toughest test in golf. And unlike Woods, when Woods was at his peak, uh, Mickelson has always been seen a little plus fragile. It, d plus this was his 48th birthday, so I'm sure he was mentally fragile at that point, knowing he's coming up to 50, right? Right, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. But his, his round is a mess. He wants to make a statement to the USGA, perhaps. Having seen this story and read about it, what, it, what was your sort of take on it from your perspective? You know, I mean, it's really hard to yeah. sort of comment on you know, somebody you don't work with, um, 
but I think you probably have touched on a number of things that were going through his mind at the time. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I think at the time he was like plus six and probably this took him out of the tournament and I'm sure he's aggravated and he's frustrated and that aggregation and frustration is probably aimed at multiple people, but USAGA is probably (laughs) the main one. And maybe he was trying to make a statement. Uh, I mean, it's very, very hard to know what actually happened, but... I mean, if you go through the process, so then he does it, and I think it's more interesting to watch what happened then. Oh, yeah, yeah. From my point of view, than necessarily what was the determinant of what he did it. It's like, well, what happened then? How did he then explain it or not explain it and rationalize it? it He did rationalize it. So, I mean, I think that's, it's very, very interesting. But, I mean, what was really going on? I I thought it, I thought his wife had the greatest comment later. She said, it just wasn't his best moment. <laughs> yeah, well, you I'm can sure always we have you, a lot of those. You right? can always count on your spouse to put it succinctly, <laughs> yeah. and just Thanks, boom, honey. there he goes. <laughs> so we, we just talked about golfers, distance runners. You worked with NFL players, NBA players. <clears throat> we tend to think of them, as, and we see them having different temperaments mm-hmm. when they're playing. Are there is there a distance runner mind, a golfer mind, a baseball player mind? Well, we always talk about, I mean, I've always been fascinated by the idea of, you know, do you choose the sport or does the, cho- does the sport choose you? Right. Um, now, obviously, physiologically, that's clearly a, a evidence, right? Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, Galen Rupp, who's the greatest American distance runner at the moment, arguably the greatest mm-hmm. one ever, you know, has won two gold medal, uh, two medals in the last two Olympic Games. I mean, he is a freak mm-hmm. in, the, in the sense that he's 5 foot 11. Right. And if you watch him run in a marathon... Um, so his next marathon is Chicago. If you watch him run that marathon, he'll look like a giant because mm. all the East Africans are five foot six really? and weigh like 85 pounds, 90 pounds. And oh, Galen right. weighs 130 and he's five foot 11. Right. So he looks like a giant. Um, but he has an engine that is just remarkable for somebody of that size. Right. Um, so you can look at the physiological piece. So, but then you look at after the physiological piece, you say, okay, is there something that's psychological? Yeah. Uh, and I think that there is something to that. I mean, you know, the, the lifestyle of a distance runner is all about training. Right. And it's very lonely, potentially. Yeah. You're, very, you're on your own a lot. Like, yeah. So Galen will run 130 miles a week, predominantly on his own. Right. Um, then he'll lift and he'll work with you know, recovery modalities and he'll work with me and he'll do these things. But it's a very, very lonely experience. I, even, I would find I it very, very lonely. I don't even drive 130 miles. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah. 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 But, but then you get other athletes like NBA guys, Major League Baseball guys. I mean, you know, you're playing all the time. Right. So oftentimes I look at it and say, you know, sometimes there's a playing, there are playing sports and there are training sports. The Olympics sports are four-year cycles aiming towards one day four years down the road. Right. And that's what we're doing. And that's everything's geared towards that one day because America in particular only cares about the second week of the Olympic Games. Right. And that's it. And they don't care about it many, right. any right. of the other sports. Right. So... So there's that piece, and then there is a temperament piece. I yeah. mean, I, 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 over the last two or three years, I've worked with um, four or five defensive linemen. I don't know why I've ended up working with defensive linemen right. that have all been very, very successful. And you know, they are different. I mean, yeah. you know, they're, 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 I can remember asking one of my defensive tackles, "What do you do for a living?" Yeah. First opening question when he when when we sat down for our first meeting, he said, um, "I play the most violent sport." And I play the most violent position in the most violent sport. Right. And I'm really good at it. Mm-hmm. Well, at that point, I decided all our sessions were going to be on Skype because he scared me. And <laughs> I, didn't want, I, I, I didn't really want to. Because I thought, because at, at some point in the process, I'm going to tell him he's doing something wrong. And I don't really yeah, want to yeah, be within yeah. arm's reach oh, while yeah. I tell him. Yeah. Swim move. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. so the reality is, I mean, that tells you the context in which yeah. they're existing. Sure. Yeah. And that's very different from a distance runner or a golfer. I yeah. mean, that's, that's very different. So all those things sort of meld together. Right. So in the work I do with the athletes is melding the temperament, personality right. with the sport, with the characteristics of the sport and how that all sort of melds together to get the same outcome, which is hopefully high level performance consistently over time. So, so is it even more of an athlete, athletic anomaly if a guy like Tony Romo is a good NFL quarterback and a good golfer? No, I think it probably comes down to the but that he's just extraordinarily physically okay. gifted. Yeah. He's physically right. gifted. Yeah. yeah, he's physically gifted. Now, I was looking at John. John is a Cleveland Browns fan. 
And I was just thinking. <laughs> I don't even want to know where you're going with this. <laughs> no, no, no. And a former sprinter, as uh, he's told us. Yes. He used to do <laughs> the fat man relays to us. He actually did that. I'm, I'm wondering, are there, are there teams that you see, whatever the sport that you say, they're onto it? Yes. They're, which teams do you like? In what, terms of onto it, in terms of. Of what you do. Yeah. Being, that being they ahead, get it. Ahead of the curve. Yeah. Forward thinking. I think there are, but I think I think it's still a tough sell. I think mm-hmm. I think I, th- I think that what's the teams that are ahead of the game are the ones that have taken more at the macro level. Yeah. So culturally, mm-hmm. so they've adopted these principles, but they do it from a culture perspective. So right. if you look at the Warriors, okay, okay. So if you look at Steve Kerr, that makes mm-hmm. sense. I mean, he's a very articulate, intelligent, um, savvy guy who right. has won at every level. Great so had to, had communicator too. Right. So I had a I had a close uh, you know a friend of mine who worked with the Warriors. And, you know, that was his takeaway. Yeah. So a lot of the players worked with my colleague. Um, but the one that had the biggest impact on the players was Kerr and the culture that he created. Right. So he made it okay to say, hey, ask questions. He made right. it okay to show weakness. He made it okay to be individual. Right. And he made it okay that, you know, as long as we're all in it together. Right. And uh, he made it a we, not me culture, which is sometimes extremely challenging in an environment like the NBA. Oh, sure. Yeah. You know, sure. I mean, like the sim- simple stuff, like the ball doesn't stop. Right, right. And right. you have to, and we need to do, hit this metric yeah. in terms of the number of passes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, again, it's, it's so culturally, I think it's become much more acceptable. Right. I think individually within the organizations, I think teams are making efforts to up upgrade this part of their support staff. But I think the fundamental challenge in the professional sports is the relationship between the players and the owners. Right. So it's like, you know, okay, so do you really want to work with a franchise mental performance coach or a sports psychologist or somebody right. within your organization? Do you really want to work with that person? Right. Or would you rather have your own person? Right. So, you know, I've been fortunate enough to work with professional franchises as the in-house guy. Right. And I don't do it anymore. Why? Because I think it's it's very hard sometimes for the players to be completely open and transparent. Yeah. Do they right. feel like there's an agenda or something? I think or? they always, even even if they trust you, yeah. Yeah. they don't trust you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because I think the nature of the relationship. Sure. I think you know, as so I always look at in the pro sports, yeah. in general, the coaches are like right in the middle. Mm-hmm. That, you know, and it's very very difficult. Sure. Um, sure. Because you have the owners who have you know the management have their agenda, the players and their representative of their agenda right. and the coaching staff are in the middle. Right. And I think it's very, very challenging. I've, I've just found it much, much easier and more productive for me to work with somebody who realizes right. that yeah. as in any counseling situation, right. you're, I'm working for you. Yeah, right. I want you to get better. Right. I'm not working for the, the franchise. I'm right. working for you. You know, it's interesting. When, when Tommy and I started as sports writers way back in the 80s, a player basically was just an extension of the team. But now, like, oh, about a few months ago, we found out LeBron James spends about a million dollars a year on his own Mm -hmm. health, on his own fitness and all those kinds of things. And we see that more and more where players, whether through social media or other things, take control of their own careers. Which Um, eliminates us as the narrators (laughs) of their, you know. But that's one of the reasons they come to you. I'm just curious, when they talk to you about teams, what is that relationship like? Do they see that, yeah, I really am part of a team, or do they see that, hey, we are partners in this? But mostly, I am about me, yeah. and not in a selfish way. Just I'm trying to get the most out of me. Uh, I would say that um, it varies as a function of the team, the franchise, and most importantly, the head coach. Yeah, I think you know certain head coaches have the ability to. Every head coach uses the same language; they right. use the same words, but certain people have the ability to pull it off. Right, and for the players to really begin to believe. And then there will be these moments during the season where the head coach has to step up right. and needs to defend his players. And whether that's to the GM or whether that's to the ownership or to the media. And at that point, those are those choice points where right. all of a sudden the, the expedient, easy thing for the coach would be is to take the party line, sign with the, with the ownership. And if they stand up for the players, I think that carries an awful lot of weight in the locker room. Yeah. So I think, I think, um, it, it very much varies from franchise to franchises. Yeah. And, and I also think that the other thing about it is that, and maybe this is a function of what you were just talking about, about um, the, this day and age, I think it's a shelf life. I think mm-hmm. a head coach has a shelf life. Yeah. And the smart ones are the ones who know when it's time to move on. 
Right. When we're talking about Los Angeles sports in particular, when we, when we think about the toughest mental athlete in L.A., Kobe Bryant might come to mind first. Um, are, is, is there anybody in L.A. that you sort of admire the way that they've approached the game from a mental standpoint, not just physically, but their, their whole branding and their whole uh, approach to, the, to, to their athletic abilities? Well, not being an L.A. guy. Yeah. Um, just from afar, maybe you can have a better perspective. I mean, I've always, I mean, I used to really, really like, when we lived in Arizona, I worked a, quite a lot in baseball. And mm. so I used to always enjoy watching, from a baseball perspective, Mike Trout mm. seemed to me to be somebody, though I must say, I'm not sure why you want to, ah, again, this is, now I'm just being pure fan. Sure. Okay. It's like, sure. you know, you're spending your entire career in Anaheim. Right. right, which right. you know, I I don't know whether you know, I mean, <laughs> but I mean, clearly in terms of his branding and in terms of who he is, but he's probably the least well-known right. superstar in any sport. Well, it is the Los Angeles Angels, by the way. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> See, I don't even know that. No, no. Of Anaheim, most, <laughs> most of them don't. I think they've dropped the uh, Anaheim, haven't they? I don't think officially. I think it's I still think the Anaheim Los Angeles Angels. <laughs> <Anaheim. laughs> but go ahead. Yeah, so that, so that, I mean that yeah. would be one who just I mean just seems to just every time you know every time I read about him and every time I watch it just seems to be a supremely so gifted let's, let's athlete. So let's talk about Trout. The fact is he doesn't look like a guy who's really thinking that much. No. Is that maybe is that maybe his genius? Is that he? It, well, he just seems to be. In the other example this week, and Dustin Johnson is the complete non-cerebral right. player. I think, okay, so here's the reality is they're both thinking. Yeah. Okay. So they have to be, right? They're, they're both thinking. <laughs> the issue is that, you know, I think that it's what are they thinking yeah. and how are they thinking and then consequently being mindful and being present when they actually have to do what they need to do. Right. Mm. So Dustin Johnson is the most talented, physically talented golfer. I yeah. believe it. Yeah. I mean, he's, I mean, if you were to pick out, you know, two or three just physically freakish right. people, right? I mean, you got Kepka. You've got McElroy, you've got Johnson, these type of individuals, they can hit the ball so far and then they've got great touch. Yeah. Ball. And he, there, was a, there was a stat a couple of years ago where he was leading in the, going into the fourth round of three out of the four majors. Right. And, and yeah. again, I mean, yeah. on this, this particular major. So you, you, if, if I'm Dustin Johnson or if I'm Dustin Johnson's support staff, I mean, at right. some point you need to take a step back and say, okay, you're getting so close. And obviously you've won a couple. And you're obviously really good. And you obviously are set for life financially. <laughs> What's the deal? Yeah. We need to sit and try to work out yeah. how do we maybe win more. Or maybe this is our, our, our frame of reference is, is somewhat skewed by Tiger. Mm -hmm. and we can't understand why <laughs> Dustin can't win more often. Sure. And right. maybe this is the norm, that they're all so it, good. Yeah, they're all of, so because good. Because the game itself does not. And, well, I think, I think that what the biggest impact of Tiger is that there are a lot more athletes playing golf now. Yep. Right? I mean, all the stories yes. of Tiger when he's at Stanford, walking into the weights room, pushing the football players out of the way, lifting more than them, being right. a better athlete than they were. I think that revolutionized the game. Now everybody can hit the ball 360 yards. Everyone's right. got a short iron in. Yeah. Um, and, you know, going, going full circle to the conversation about Mickelson, it's like, yeah. okay, see, so it puts USAGA, it puts the PGA, it puts, you know, the RNA in a real tough spot. Sure, what do we gotta, do? They got to fix the course. What so do we do? Do we, do we really want tournaments that are being won like a regular PGA event right. minus right. thirty six right. or whatever? I mean, is that fun? Right. Yeah. So I mean, it's a real, it's a really interesting thing. But I think that that was the major impact of Tiger. But to assume that you know one through sixty who teared off on Thursday are all that good athletically. Right. They're just better athletes. Right. They weren't playing yeah. golf back. You know, pre-Tiger, they were playing. No. They were trying to play baseball, or they were trying to play basketball, and now it's like, wow, I can play golf. Is Tiger a key athlete in your field? In that, when he came around, there were all these stories about what his dad had done with him, and it all became about mental hmm. toughness. Is he a big guy as far as people finally buying in and saying, "Oh, this is important because of what this guy's doing"? I don't know because I mean, it's such an interesting story. Yeah. Um, he used to jiggle car keys when he was in his back swing and all this kind of stuff <laughs> getting yeah. used to interruptions but was yeah. he was he part of the, uh, the the culture of nike when you were involved with them yeah i mean he's okay. still there i mean yeah. you, know, you know tiger woods conference center i mean yeah. you know it's uh you know i mean the, the bump to the share price when tiger does well is remarkable <laughs> yeah. even when they're not even selling golf clubs anymore i mean yeah. it's yeah. like yeah. yeah i mean he is a he's an iconic figure
But let me ask you about that. You're a dad. Mm-hmm. And I, I do remember when Tiger came mm-hmm. along, a bunch of dads I knew started doing that kind of stuff, like basically torturing their child, like <laughs> toughing them up. Toughing them up. Does right. that actually work? Or is Ti- would Tiger have been fine if his dad was the Dalai Lama? I mean, it, you know. Well, one could make the argument. It, that's a great hypothetical, right? I right. mean, so given what happened later. Yeah. Yes. yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. the way the way I typically look at it, you can get, you can get a response that you want through yeah. coercive, um, controlling type of behaviors, right. creating that type of environment for a short period of time. Mm. If you're willing to deal with what comes afterwards, right. So we're in LA. Mm-hmm. So who? Did, I mean, the parent that is most right. famous for sure. that. You know the quarterback at SC, right? Marinovich. Right. Well, and then yeah. currently the Ball family, right? And right. so it's like you know you you look at it and say, okay, we you can Andre Agassi's yes. father. I mean, if you look at him and say, yes, we can do this. You can you can. You know, I mean, you mentioned you introduced Jack, my thirteen year old. We mm. could create an incredibly controlling environment, right? And we could put him through all of that. And in terms of if your goal is to create the ultimate athlete, right? That may work for a short period of time, mm. right? But at some point, Jack, does what, he mess with your head a lot? <laughs> Sorry, I'm just ca- I'm, I'm just protecting you from child custody. I was going to ask you one time. I, I was talking to my kids about an article I'd written, and it became clear that they hadn't read it. And I finally went, "Do you ever read anything right. I write?" And they're like, "No." We got to project him. That's all. His, his typical response. His typical response whenever I sort of switch into sort of professional yes. mode is he looks no. at me and he has this very quizzical look and goes. I'm Darren Treasure, and I'm really smart. And, <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I work with all these tough athletes. I knew that was Steve. <laughs> <laughs> it's very annoying. How young... When you have, do you have people with young kids who come to you and want you to work with their kids? And oh, how young will you work with a kid? Oh, yeah. Yes, and I don't work with their kids. Why? Because my sweet spot is working with elite-level okay. athletes okay. And, okay. at order. Okay. That makes and, and also financially, <laughs> yeah, also yeah, yeah. Is, also comes down to it as well. But it's also I just I mean I think it's there are there are thousands of people out there who can do the work that you would want to do with twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen year olds. Right. And you sh- that work should be taking place. Right. But where the work should really be taking place is with the coaches, because ultimately those youth coaches are the ones who have much more influence. Because oftentimes when you're working with these, those young kids, what you're actually doing is you're, you're creating a support structure around because of the poor coaching that's taking place. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right? So if, we, if the coaching gets better and the coaches are delivering the, 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 the content and setting up the environment appropriately, then really it, they'll just naturally learn a lot of these things. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, when I lived in... When, when we when I lived in Arizona, I worked with a youth soccer club, and we were very very. The, the soccer club was extremely successful, and we all my graduate students worked with all the kids. Right. And I remember the director of coaching. There was a big article in I don't know which magazine, the soccer Soccer America, about the club, and that was the piece they really sort of hooked onto was the right. fact that he, here is this club in Arizona doing this mental skills training from U11 on. And the kids that seem to, and the team for a small market are beating up all the big kids right. At, right. at these national tournaments. And and you know, many of these kids, have, you know, particularly on the girls' side, have gone on the women's side. Sorry, have gone on and played for the national team. Right. And it was because of this program. Right. Um, so that's the right time to do it. And yeah. It's just teaching basic. Going back to your point, it's teaching basic skills that mm-hmm. are going to enable you to be more effective. So goal setting. How to visualize? Mm-hmm. How to how to use your self talk more appropriately? Um, how to be more mindful? How to use yeah. breathing? And if you start, but how to have fun too, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Fun. Because fun is sucked out of a lot of yeah. sports yeah. at that age. Yeah, absolutely. Fun. <laughs> <laughs> Tommy and I were talking about. <laughs> Tommy and I were talking about this, about, about performance, about winning, yeah. that so much in life, and I think social media kind of breeds this, like, I'm having the best vacation, I'm yeah. having the best life. Do you have to talk to people about that? About Life isn't in, winning? Actually, yeah, <laughs> what success actually is. Yeah, I mean, I, it, it, it sounds cliche, and it is cliche, but it's about the journey. Yeah, and, the process, you know, and, and learning it's, it's from a, the It's a process, process it's a yeah. journey, and you know, there are more knockbacks than there are successes. Right. Um, and, you know, if you, and if you can only see success as winning, yeah. you are really going to struggle, both athletically and in life. Yeah. So, I mean, it is about being very, very aware of the fact that success and the way you define it, yeah. And I always, with any of my athletes, even my best athletes, it's subjective. 
it's not objective. Yeah. Because if you get into it's about it's a win or it's a loss, how much control do you really have over that? Right. I mean, you don't have a lot of control over that. Yeah. Do you have a question, John? No, nah, I'm just saying. Oh, you're he's listening. <laughs> I'm just. He's, take, I'm, he's I'm a like, listener. I'm he's taking good. in everything. This is well, uh, this is really well. Interesting. John had a loss uh, this weekend. He was at the Hollywood Palladium at some <laughs> punk show, and he got punked. It wasn't really so much a loss. It was, it was a did part they, of uh, growing up. Did they? Have to, well, <laughs> right. Just ask you this. Learning experience. Did they have to carry you out of the Hollywood Palladium? No, no, no. I walked myself out. <laughs> yeah. I was totally fine. I walked myself out of the pit. Actually, I went around the first time after I got picked back That's up. That's a win right there. Yeah. I didn't even let that get me down. When I was starting as a sports writer, I, I started for the LA Times, but they had me in Orange County, and this is in the '80s. So you got a lot of families out there who are go, 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 and success driven, whatever. And they, just, would, they yeah. would put their kids in camps and camps and personal. This is when personal coaching really started to, right. to build. This is pre lacrosse too. Right. <laughs> then some. Then some. <laughs> yeah. Then some kid would just show up. Oh, what's this? A basketball? And he'd be better than everybody. Yep. And you've hit on this a couple times that we really do believe that if I can just mentally envision it, then I can you know really. But the fact is, some people are just physically, genetically engineered to do that thing. Right. Yes. Michael Jordan was just made to play basketball. Yeah, I mean, if you yeah. or baseball or baseball, well, not so much. <laughs> mm. yeah. I mean, but but if you look, if you you know, it's funny. Um, I was having a conversation with with Jeff earlier, well, yesterday about um, you know, he made the comment about you know, soccer play. Well, I'm I because my son was playing in this basketball t- tournament down in Anaheim this weekend, which is why we're down here. And and I text Jeff and I said, I can I can explain why the U.S. is not playing in the World Cup. And he said, how's that? I said, come down and watch this. There is more talent uh-huh. playing basketball in this gym yeah. than it, there is in the U15 or U14 right. boys national team for U.S. soccer. Somewhat facetious. Right. But the reality no, is, it true. Is, it is true. It's true. I mean, you gravitate. You know, Every other country that's playing in the World Cup, that's where all their best athletes sure. go. Sure. That's where they go. Yeah. Um, As Iceland proved against Argentina, right? Right. right. Unt- unt- until your body changes, <laughs> yeah. which now comes back to your point. Yeah. So, like, I played soccer growing up up until about the age of, uh, like, 12 or 13. Yeah. And then my body changed, and all of a sudden, unfortunately, rugby became my sport. Oh. And, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. Sorry about that. Yeah, exactly. So, I, have, <laughs> you mean, I can't run a 10K either. So, it's like... <laughs> The closest I get is watching yeah, them. Yeah, rug, rugby was my reason. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you, so you just realize that, you know, and, and it's the same thing. I mean, like, I, I, you, know, you, you can be this five foot six kid or five foot eight kid to right. your point who really does everything right. But then ultimately the six foot right. two kid shows up and sure. six foot two kids better. Yeah, exactly. Just because, you know, in basketball, for example, just being tall helps. Yeah. So, so I think, I think the reality is we get caught up in this. There is a the way I always look at it is that w- you look at the physiological biomechanical stuff first and then go to the brain. It's mm-hmm. way too easy. So I'll work with coaches and they'll say, Tom, mental breakdown. That was that was a meltdown. Yeah. And I'm like, don't go there. That's mm. way too easy. Why don't we take a step back and look at the training? Yeah. And look at th- some of the things we've done hydration wise and physiologically and biomechanically so and the load things. and metrics and all these things before we just go, oh. It's mental. Wow. Why do they do that? It's just easier to it's do that? It's easy. Yeah. It's yeah. easy. Well, and also because part, then it's on the player, right? Yeah, it's, yeah. Always, it's on the player. Right. Exactly. You know, so I think that one of the interesting things about the way sports science is now, particularly, uh, you know, it's becoming more um, in vogue now in the professional sports in this country. A lot of a lot of the big, the more cutting edge franchises have a sports science department. Right. It doesn't compare to, for example, around the world in other sports. But right. U.S. is getting there. They don't really want to invest in it, I don't think, but they feel they have to. But, I mean, if you look at professional sports around the world, that has become a huge part of it. It's like monitoring, tracking metrics, load, making sure that the diet's right, making sure the hydration is right, making sure that some of the other things, giving the information back to the coaching staff that they can make really good decisions about how they manage players. For example, I find it absolutely hilarious when, um, you know, for example, three or four years ago where Popovich got into so much trouble for resting players. Right. Mm-hmm. In the Premier League, that's all they do. Mm-hmm. It's all about managing your roster. Sure. Right. Um, the whole idea is that, you know what, we don't care what happens in September. Right. We want all our best players to be fit in in April yeah. when they're playing in the semifinal of the Champions League. Why do you think we're behind when we have all this money to invest in sports? It's- 
it seems like they they want to make the regular season be an important thing. I think I think it, I mean ultimately I hate to say it, I think every, everything ultimately comes yeah. down to the dollars, right? Yeah. And and uh, and maybe the the way that it's set up. I mean, people get very upset when they show up. I mean, live in Portland, people get very upset if you show up for a Trailblazers game and LeBron doesn't play if Cleveland are in town. Right. Everyone's like, oh, oh yeah, yeah okay. I paid to right. see. Whereas, you know, around the world, I think it's much more you show up to see the teams. Yeah. Uh, Manchester United play Manchester City. And yeah, there happen to be 11 players on both sides, but you're not going there to see a player. You're right. going there to see right. the teams play. Yeah, I just saw this weird stat, too, about how Major League Baseball at this point has more teams with, I don't know what the threshold is, 40 or 40 wins or more right. than ever before because there's so many teams that are elite and so many that are just accepting losing. <laughs> right. And they're just going to do that. And, right. and that's just their – but the thing – the dawn of me that I want to ask you about too, one of the things that LeVar Ball has been famous for doing is talking things into existence, basically with getting his son drafted and being great. As a mental coach, can you actually talk your way into making something happen just by keep repeating it? Or is that just something that we've sort of created a narrative in the, in the media? If all those other pieces are there, so physically you can do it, biomechanically you can do it, lifestyle you can do it, all of those pieces are there, I'd rather have the athlete who thinks they can do it and are talking themselves into it than the right. athlete who thinks opposite. Right. Right. But at the end of the day, um, again, I don't know the ins and outs of the Lakers that much, but ultimately I would imagine they're going to pick players I, I can't imagine that the Lakers are drafting based on what a father is saying. Right. It's they, almost, but it's almost become that narrative because it's almost people like saying, well, the ball wasn't that great of a player, but his dad just kept saying it so much. Maybe Magic Johnson was brainwashed into thinking that that's the way to do it. Mm. And, and then if it succeeds, he keeps thinking, you know, this guy knows, has some secret, right? It ain't going to help no. with the next kid, I'll tell no, you No, but it, maybe yeah. this is the example of it failing yeah. or not succeeding that sort of shows that yeah. it, you can't talk something into existence. Right. Well, I, I don't know about... I'd be I, six foot two. I mean, I don't, I don't know about talking something yeah. into into existence, but ultimately, going back to the comment earlier, yeah. confidence is the, yeah, the guardian confidence. angel of performance, mm, right? Sure. So if you have two athletes, the individual who thinks they're confident... And, and basically, you know, confidence is a bit like the word motivation. Everyone's got an opinion, but no one really knows what it is. I mean, and is it a fine line, too, between that and narcissism or whatever? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, absolutely. There's, I mean, yeah, I mean, going back to the whole mental health piece, yeah. I mean, yeah, that's narcissism is a, is, a, is, a, is a thing. And it's a thing in elite level sports because from a very young age, some of these extraordinarily physically gifted individuals sur get surrounded by people who just enable them and tell them they're great. Yeah. 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 And then they walk into an environment, you know, at some point where they go, no, nah, you're not that great. Yeah. yeah. And, and by the way, I, I'd like all of you to start doing that with me. Okay. I really, <laughs> do we do? I'm not feeling the love. You, you mentioned, you, you, you mentioned mental. You want me to tell you you're not that great? <laughs> I can do this. He's his mental health coach. Loud and clear, by the way, yeah. buddy. He just wants to be beaten down. We, 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 did a show, we did a show a couple of weeks ago about mental health. And um, you've talked about this, too, about um, the physical aspects of that. And, and uh, i just I just like you to, because this is something that obviously affects everyone, not yeah. just yeah. elite athletes. Um, wh what are the things that you've learned that you do that can be applied to everybody watching us right now to kind of keep themselves healthy mentally? I mean, this is what I think the most important thing is recognizing that one, it's not unusual. Yep. It's mm -hmm. it's become more normal. I think when people have become more aware yeah. of what it actually is. So I think the numbers have increased. Um, the percentage of people who are who are um, sort of suffering from mental health issues, that number has gone up as people have become more aware. Right. Well, that's me. Mm. Wow, and I, I just thought it was, you know, I didn't realize it was that, but that's me. I think what's really interesting from the research perspective is the most powerful thing you can, the one thing you can do to help, particularly with depression, yeah. is be physically active. Mm. Amazing. So there's, you know, the yeah. easy thing is we're, we're a pop a pill type of society. I'd rather take a pill yeah. that, you know, somehow cures me. Right. But, the, but there's a causal relationship between physical activity and, and depression. Right. And um, the more physically active you are, the less chances are you're going to have depression or you can manage depression. And it's something to do with the, um, the way that the brain operates when, okay. it's, when it's going through physical activity. It's something to do with dopamine and the endorphins. Yeah, right. And so if people, even if they're just feeling a little low, right. get out and walk. Right. I mean, I'm not saying run a 10K. Get out and walk. Get that outside. Anyway. Right. Uh, yeah, that's right. I can walk. That's, why that's what I'm saying. Walk. I, can, I can walk off a pier too, but you know, you're the other, the other people that are kind of... The other thing that's really, really interesting is just the outdoors. Yeah. Being yes. outdoors. Yeah. Yes. Now, 
Now, L.A. may not necessarily sort of strike you as the outdoors type of place, but yeah. I mean, just being outside. Right. I mean, there's a relationship between nature and, and positive mental health states. So, I mean, I think if, if, if people can just sort of do that, right. that's a start. Now, that is in no way to say, hey, if you're still suffering, right. you shouldn't go and see you know, a doctor and you uh, shouldn't yeah. go and see a clinician and you shouldn't maybe get help right. beyond that. But in general, for the population as a whole, the American population as a whole, if we were just more active, yeah. it would it would cure and help ameliorate so many issues that we face on a daily basis. How do, how do we speak to our brain if we are feeling depressed or whatever? And we, it's one of those things like even when we gain weight, we know exercise is good for us. We know we should do it and then we don't do it and then it makes us go lower. Yes. How do we talk to ourselves to get ourselves out there without crippling judgment and things like that? Well, I think, I mean, that's a, I mean, <laughs> that's a great question. I mean, because if you look at it, great question, Steve. Thank you, sir. You feel better now? <laughs> no, so, I mean, I'm going to go run. <laughs> so <bad. laughs> You're so great, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> now we're talking. I mean, if you think about it, I mean, you know, be, health club. Yes. The day after New Year's Day. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. How many people are there signing up? So many. Oh, incredible. Yeah. Three months later, it's well intentioned. 50% of them have quit. Right. Okay? It's, it's the most robust statistic in behavioral science, behavioral medicine. And predictable. Every, Absolutely. So predictable. And you know, the health club industry is based on it. Because right. they, <laughs> they don't want everybody showing up because no. they, there wouldn't be enough they, stuff. Be, be enough stuff. So right. they work on the assumption <laughs> people are going to quit. Right. And they've signed up for five years, paying every month. But anyway, that's a whole different story. Um, but, the, but the reality here is that, I mean, we, we understand that it's difficult. And so right. accepting the fact that it's difficult, maybe you're going to miss every now and again. But it's like, you know, going back to the simple stuff, a little goal set. Okay, I don't want to overdo it. I mean, right. some people like, okay, I'm going to start, I'm going to run. Yeah. Well, why are you running? You haven't yeah. run for yeah. 25, 30 years. Right. Why don't you walk yep. and just go and maybe make it social? Do as it my, with. As my wife said about the 10K. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do it with your buddy. Why go for a run right. with your friend. Yeah. You know, so that you, know, so yeah. that you actually, because I mean, that's another variable. It has that to be is very enjoyable. Predictive. Yeah, going back to the thing, yeah. fun. I mean, we yeah. are basically, we're social animals. Right. And typically, you know, with the exception of like someone like Galen who runs 130 miles on his own. But right. I mean, the reality is we're social animals and we want to go out there and we want to be with people. Is that and enjoyable the, to him, do you think? Um, the running the 130 miles? Yeah. Um, that seems like such a grind that I would quit the first it, day. It, it is it is a grind. And again, that's why there are very few people. That's yeah. why, you know, he's going to be one of maybe three or four guys who can win the gold medal in Tokyo. Because mm-hmm. there's only because three he, or four of us who can actually... Because he mentally has oh. overcome that as being a yeah, grind. I mean, he, he might say, I understand this is a grind, but this is what I have to do. Yeah, I mean, I've worked with... Two, two of those four guys, mm-hmm. or two of those five guys that will toe the line in Tokyo in 2020 that can do that. One's Mo Farah, who's yeah. a Brit, oh, yeah. mm-hmm. and, and Galen. And then there will be um, a guy called... Uh, um, Brain's on dead. A couple of Kenyans. And Steve Prefontaine? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but they, but, they'll t- but they, they can do the grind. Right. But going, back, going back to the question about, you know, actually mental health. Yeah. And right. Again, I mean... Not in any way to d- diminish it, but if you can be more physically active and get right. out there and do it with your friends and make it a social thing, that's going to help. Yeah, it's. I mean, and and it's going to help with a lot of, for a lot of people. There are going to be a percentage where that's just not enough, right. and they really, really need to go and get real get, medical help. Yeah. But just being physically active and just sort of getting out there and doing it, yeah, and using your self-talk and being mindful and present. I think all those things yeah. help. Mindful, yeah. mindfulness is a. It can be like a catch brand phrase, but it is very helpful. Well, I mean, the, the essence of mindfulness is breathing, yeah. just learning how to breathe. And it's funny, I teach that to all my athletes. I mean, all my athletes, um, that's a big part of what they, I, because it just, everything slows down, yeah. everything becomes more manageable. Um, and when that happens, they can then just move on. And so, you know, I, <laughs> I have one of my guys, um, it's very, very hard to get him to do this. So we, we, we look at risk factors. Uh, one of the conversations I often have with my athletes is risk factors. Mm-hmm. You know, you have this great life. Mm-hmm. Um, you're playing NFL, you're playing the NBA, you make a lot of money. What are some of the risk factors? Well, for this one individual, one of the risk factors is his driving. Mm-hmm. Um, he drives very quickly. Uh, okay. And so one of the things that uh, we managed, have managed to get him to do is that after practice and before he gets into the car, he actually does some breathing exercises. Wow. And uh, it, 
he says it's really helped. Is it ironic that, you know, he, I was told by one of his teammates who I also work with that, you know, one day he was out there in his car doing his breathing exercises and the rest of the team saw him doing it. So they all came and sort of sat, stood around the car, staring <laughs> at him. He's got his eyes closed and he's doing his breathing exercises. <laughs> so he opens his eyes and all of the, <laughs> the entire defense of this NFL team are just stood around looking at him. That's an amazing thing. Like Tommy and I, from years of writing, like everything has collapsed and we breathe totally from yep. up here. Yeah. And when you do some yoga, or whatever and oh, actually breathe. yoga is the best thing for golf it's, it's so different because yeah. it, it teaches your breathing it teaches your tension it, yeah it, and that's really what the swing is the golf swing is is a, is a perfect example which you just need to sort of not think about and just do tell me before we go i, I I'll, I'll just own it so i have my own 10k story real quick i was a 19 year old kid my brother-in-law says hey do you want to run a 10k i'm like sure he goes, well, you should train. I'm like, oh, I'll ride a bike. Yeah, I'm good. So we show up to this 10K. We start running, and we're going, and then I can see the finish line. And I'm in the top 10. And I'm oh. like, oh, wow, I was a basketball player. I'm like, oh, this is what I was meant to be. And I start sprinting, and I'm passing guys. And uh, we were running around this giant lagoon. And as I'm just about to break into the top five, the guy at the uh, finish line goes, and around we go again. <laughs> oh. And literally my brain went like this. And within 20 minutes, I had 80-year-olds going, keep it up, Ted, don't get there, and just zipping right by. Hey, we want to thank Darren for showing up with you. I hope I hope sometime when you're down here again, we can talk again. Yeah, this is great. fascinating stuff, right? Yep. I think it applies to a lot of different things, not just A lot athletics. of things, yeah. yeah. I was going to ask you, what's it like to be a – a performance coach, is it like being a marriage counselor where everyone's going, well, then you better have the perfect marriage? Like yeah, you people must be see the you? best guy. I'm perfect. <laughs> <laughs> right, Jack? He's perfect. <laughs> this works out fine because England's <laughs> about to start playing Tunisia, and he's freaking out. There's a TV right in. He's going nuts. Hey, thanks Thank very you. much uh, for watching the drill. We'll see you down the road. Thanks.